but I wanted to explain a little bit about what it is that we're doing. Um, obviously, to repeat and to go through a liturgy that dates from 1799 means you'll notice a couple of things. First of all, it's very wordy. Uh, the vocabulary is occasionally quite different from ours. And the other thing that you will notice, we've actually done some accommodations, is that if this were actually celebrated in 1799, um, this would be black. There would be no stoles. There would be no candles on the altar, ever. And because there is no processional cross that you'll notice. Because all of those things at that time were considered far too Catholic for the Episcopal Church. <laughs> that, that actually didn't begin to change until almost 100 years later. It was the late 1800s with the revival of, the, of what's called the Oxford Movement in England that a lot of things that we take for granted, in fact, think are kind of low church, like just a colored stole, not chasuble, and all those sort of things that are pretty well standard for most of us now. If you grew up in a low church part of the United States, as a child, some of this will seem very, very familiar to you. And so I want you to know that if you go, well, why did they not do what you might think of is appropriate on Sunday morning? It's because we're doing our best with a few accommodations to be as faithful to the liturgy of the 18th century as we can, where those kinds of things were considered overreach. New Catholic. So we will start in a minute. Now you will notice we will process in on a psalm, which is right here in the front. And we will do that alternately by whole verses. I saying a verse, and then all of you responding in procession. Okay? So calm down, get ready for worship. This really should be worship, not just a reenactment. And, uh, and then we'll begin. When was the last time you heard a hymn like that that spoke so openly about death? <coughs> it's a different sense from what typically happens for in church. Even the sense of the way the scripture is organized and the content of the reading gives the impression that the, as they describe the Christian life, here's what happens. You're a part of a world, all kinds of people who believe all kinds of things, and yet, whether it be by virtue of your parents and godparents, or of your own volition, you come into baptism. Baptism is a water that separates. It separates you from all of those other directions, other things that you could pursue outside of the will of God. And it not only separates you from those things, it also sets you on a course, a course where Heaven is your destination. That's where you're going. And therefore, all of your life, including your clear, what is it, what does it say? Your bounden duty and service, is given to Christ for him in his work, whether that be in the ordained ministry or whether that be in you name the profession. Even there, your conduct is never to be, as they would say, unseemly but instead meant to reflect the heavenly destination and the mark of baptism that has been yours. With that understanding of the Christian life, separated from going toward this house of worship, as we have prayed, is meant to be that place that in fact both expresses that separated life by virtue of it being a separated place and furnished in such a way as that it reminds us of that heavenly destination. While some of the early colonial churches did not have stained glass windows, by the time this church was built and many of them were included, do you see what it produces? Who are you surrounded with? You're surrounded with those who are in heaven. It's the reminder of Hebrews. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us run with patience the race that is set before us. In other words, what the church was meant to do was to be a place that reminded the people who were in it of both their heavenly destination, 
and as such reminded them of the clear focus and the direction of their lives. Therefore, we also, even as we have hallowed this place in the, the phrases that we have used, as well dedicate ourselves, as we will say later, those of you who know right one will remember this, and here we offer and present unto thee, O Lord, ourselves, our souls, and bodies to be a reasonable, holy, and living sacrifice unto thee. All of that is expressed within the content of this service as why would a Christian want to pursue anything other than that? Unless they fall into that terrible category that these writers would call being worldly. Meaning, yes, by baptism they certainly belong to Christ. But you sure can't tell it from their behavior. And because we gather together in this building, this building is meant to remind the worldly that where do you think you're going after you pass through this life? Don't you want to be fit for heaven? The preacher would say. What else do you think might be your eternal destination? Or would you actually really like to be in hell? That's not something that I would certainly wish for. They were very plain. And so it was that when we came, when this church came together in that late 18th century act, they were doing more than consecrating a building. They were consecrating themselves to be that group of people within that building that would live out all that this building was meant to express. So that even as the building is hallowed, so they are saying, we also. <coughs> have both been hallowed by Christ in baptism, but also affirm for ourselves the dedication of that most high call to live as men and women who live with an eternal destination in view, knowing that it is for it is that for which we have been baptized, and in fact, for nothing less. So certainly this weekend, as we give thanks for the extraordinary courage, uh, the amazing sacrifice that is that, M, that really is this building represents, the call also to a preacher at this occasion is not only to give thanks for those who have made such a sacrifice of their lives, but to say to this congregation settled now, will you be their heirs? Will you also be those men and women? who understand that in baptism you have been separated from Christ and that your destination is heaven, a heavenly one and to live in such a way as that your life expresses the very thing that this building embodies. If that's true, then you also will be an heir of all that this building expressed when it was originally dedicated in 1799. And that is the whole sense of the scriptures, both the Corinthian lesson as well as the John lesson talk about living in a way that is in fact separate from the ways of the world. Whether we're talking about marriage partners, whether we're talking about business, all comes under, you see, the Lord of the world, the Lord of all life. Therefore, in those callings to which we have been given, we are invited by this liturgy to dedicate ourselves. And it is certainly my hope that as we hear the words of the liturgy, the scripture, the music, we say, as we will all say later, and here we offer and present unto thee ourselves. Amen. Amen.